of the Southern Song, as we move into a period from which a lot more reliable work survives, we can begin to address certain um, big uh, concerns, such as political themes in painting, in court painting especially, or poetic painting. <clears throat> this latter poetic painting means different things to different people. Uh, I myself gave a series of lectures that turned into a book titled The Lyric Journey, Poetic Painting in China and Japan. But as I acknowledge in that book, uh, I certainly am not claiming that my definition of poetic painting is the only right one, or the best one, even. Um, uh, in a broad sense, a lot of Southern Song Academy painting is poetic, or tries to be poetic, uh, try, partly because it responds much of the time to couplets and quatrains of poetry that were set by the imperial uh, patrons of the artists, so they were responding to that, partly because the artists knew their imperial patrons wanted poetic paintings, which are very popular in the Southern Sun period in the Academy. I'll develop that theme more as we move further into Southern Sun painting, but I want to keep it always uh, problematic. Not, it's not a quality that one can define clearly and uh, identify easily in paintings. So now on to Lecture 9b. Now I'm going to talk about political themes in sort of early Southern Sun painting, particularly the theme of dynastic restoration, which of course is a very big theme in, uh, for the Emperor Gaozong and his court, because he had restored the dynasty, so to speak, relocating it in the south. Uh, Gaozong was the ninth son of Huizong. He didn't automatically uh, succeed to the throne. He needed to establish his legitimacy. Everybody didn't uh, recognize it immediately. And paintings were done for this purpose. Notably by, uh, well, there was a Li Tang follower named Xiao Zhao, I mentioned, but I'm leaving out. He has a whole series of dynastic omens, or uh, omens that predicted and thereby, so to speak, legitimized the ascendance of Gaozong to the throne. Um, very good writing on this topic has been done by Julia Murray, who teaches at the University of Wisconsin in uh, Madison. And uh, especially, she has a book called Mirror of Morality, Chinese Narrative Illustration and Confucian Ideology, Honolulu, University of Hawaii Press 207. I'm going to show only two related paintings described to Li Tang, probably copies, but at any rate, just to illustrate this idea of, uh, of uh, a political painting being done at this time. The theme of political painting is one that I, I had an early seminar on. Um, I and my students are among the pioneers in this um, in, in dealing with this subject. And uh, I had a, a chapter on it in my book called Three Alternative Histories of Chinese Painting. So if, if you want to read more about political painting in my version of it, that's what it is. Okay, here now is a scroll, first please, um, in the Palace Museum in Beijing. Uh, I don't have good slides of it, unfortunately, but it's, uh, it's, it's attributed to, um, to Li Tang, and it's probably, I think, a uh, close copy after Li Tang. Uh, it doesn't look, the drawing of the foliage and other things don't look quite like the hand of the master. But important paintings of this kind, court paintings, were done in copies and copies by court artists to be presented to people or to preserve the composition or whatever. So in, in lots of cases, we have the close copy and we don't have the original. I would assume that's the case here. At any rate, the subject... Uh, is two virtuous brothers named Bo Yi and Chu Shi, who at the be beginning of the Zhou Dynasty, way back in the you know 10th, 11th century BC, withdrew into the wilderness uh, and starved to death rather than change their allegiance and serve under a ruler whom they saw as lacking in virtue. So they became paragons of the idea of refusing to serve the wrong ruler and, uh, and starving rather than, than changing their allegiance. So this idea of loyalty, the idea of unchanging loyalty, is important, of course, to the new Southern Song ruler, who's still intent on, as I say, establishing his legitimacy. So here are the two brothers, one of them raising his finger as if somehow talking to the other one. They have a basket, they gather herbs, they, and they have a, a kind of a pick, or, or hope, which, uh, thing over here, 
uh, of the other one. Uh, they gathered herbs for a while and they lived and they finally starved to death anyway. Um, and here you see them in the wilderness. Next please. Here's the, the two of them on a somewhat better side with their basket and various other things. Okay, this is a very poignant theme for the Chinese uh, of this time certainly and Chinese later. The cliff behind you can see done in something like Li Tong style axe cuts on. So presumably there's a real Li Tong painting behind this at least. Now here is the uh, further on. Um, it's a short scroll, ink and colors on paper, and it's important, as I say, is, is preserving at least a very important old composition of the kind that Li Tong must have done. Here are the two figures, uh, large things of theirs. We don't have much of figure painting from Li Tong, so it's hard to say much about it, but it's quite fine figure painting. Date, hard to say. Maybe maybe later in Song, maybe Yuan Dynasty, who knows. At any rate, fi fine uh, relatively early painting, uh, expressive, uh, strong. Well, um, next please. Yeah, here we go. Now, uh, another scroll, this one in the Metropolitan Museum, uh, represents, again, is attributed to Li Tong, and I would take it to be an early Academy copy after Li Tong again. Uh, this is the scroll, uh, Jin Wan Gong's Return, and uh, it was uh, it was in C.C. Wong's collection and bought by Wan Fong from C.C. Wong. A good purchase, I think, an important early painting. Uh, the text comes from the Zhao Zhuan, a Zhou Dynasty text, and has to do with a ruler, uh, no, excuse me, the exile and the return of the ninth son of the ruler of one of the Zhou states, the state of Jin. So, since uh, Gao Zheng was the ninth son, this is, was very relevant to the situation of Gaozong at the beginning of Southern Song. This is, by the way, uh, discussed at length and reproduced in Wen Fong's book, Beyond Representation, uh, where he gives a full and much more enlightened uh, treatment of the painting. I'm only just putting it in as an example and speaking of it very generally. Again, the details in the painting, these large rocks with uh, sort of shading more than texture strokes, really, and the treatment of the uh, tree foliage and such, uh, suggest the hand of a very good academy master. I'm not going to try to tell the story. Here it is uh, car, uh, car chariots with, uh, with figures in them making their way through a mountain pass among the trees. And here a section with two people meeting on the shore of a river or lake under, under a pine tree. Um, it's, as I say, it's an important scroll and uh, if you read Wen Fong's text you can see what the how the story goes and what the uh, what these uh, uh, illustrated incidents really are. Next, please. Yeah, here is the uh, main scene of Jin Wan Gong's return. He's coming to a gate attended by all his uh, ministers and other attendants in a chariot. And here a detail of it. Fine figure painting, uh, academy master, presumably presumably after a work by by Li Tang. And here a section of uh, in which you see him was, uh, talking with someone else in the uh, inside the building, inside the house after his return. Okay, enough of that. Uh, as I say, I'm not really trying to trying to uh, uh, either date it or to uh, to uh, uh, identify the themes more than in a very general way. Well, I should make the point here, however, that political themes and much of the rest of the thematics, the subject matter of early Chinese painting, and especially academy painting, as is to be understood, I think, in relation to the demands and the situation of the clientele, the people the artist was working for, and not the artist himself. The same is true in later times, I think. That is to say, um, artists who were uh, uh, academy artists working in the court, or outside artists, professional artists, various kinds, um, would would choose their themes according to their understanding of what their clientele wanted, the people who were going to acquire their paintings by purchase or otherwise. And um, the people who acquired them wanted very often to use them for gifts, to honor somebody, or to uh, to praise somebody or whatever. They had their very, very real, real reasons for this. And sometimes we can construct the uh, circumstances by uh, from inscriptions uh, mounted with the paintings. Well, this whole idea of how to how to read these paintings 
uh, was a big area of controversy for a while. There's, there's, there's still scholars who are so enamored of the idea of the free artist sort of painting whatever he pleases uh, that they want to read the paintings that way. I think that's, that's the wrong direction. Uh, Li Tong didn't wake up some one day and say, I think I'll draw Li uh, Jin Wan Gung today. And painters of, painters of Buffalo and Herd Boys, same way, they, they, they have a political theme which they are illustrating. And they, it isn't that they sort of were wandering out in the wilderness and they saw water buffalo and herd boys. I oh, that's beautiful. I think we'll paint that. No, that's a romantic idea, which is inapplicable, I think, to uh, court painting especially and to professional painting more generally in China. Okay, now let's go on. Now I want to show as a painting with a political content and function, a hand scroll in the Freer Gallery purchased by Charles Freer in 1919 as a work by Li Gung Lin. It's highly unlikely that it was painted by Li Gung Lin, however. I'd rather see it as the work of an anonymous professional master. This is the title, the first thing one sees on enrolling, unrolling the scroll, by an unknown calligrapher with false seals. Old scroll labels, probably formerly pasted on the outside of the scroll, are at left. Uh, next, please. Mounted after the painting is an inscription by the calligrapher Li Peng, written in 1110, and if the paintings originally went with this inscription, that would provide an early 12th century date for the paintings, maybe still Northern Song. Li Peng tells of seeing a screen painting of the same subject at the home of the great calligrapher Huang Ting Jian. He, remember, was the friend of Su Dong Po, famous calligrapher and, anyway, scholar. And on this basis, he attributes the paintings in this scroll to Li Gong Lin, but they don't resemble any of the paintings more reliably associated with Li Gong Lin. As we're seeing, his name is attached to lots of old pictures to make them more valuable, more saleable. I put this scroll here among the paintings with political themes because we know that scrolls of this subject were sometimes presented to officials on their retirement. Scholar officials, even when they were serving enthusiastically in the court or in the provincial posts, we're always supposed to be longing to be back on the farm, back at home. Uh, this is an enduring political myth in China, and this painting and this poem uh, celebrate that ideal of returning home. Next, please. This is the Homecoming Ode by Tao Yuanming, as written out by a later calligrapher named Shun Hao in one of the colophones on the scroll. Um, I put it on just for those who read Chinese to have something to look at. Tao Yuanming composed his homecoming poem in AD 206, as he himself retired from office and returned to his home in the country. It's one of the most beloved and best known of all Chinese poems. I'll read uh, the translation provided in the Freer Gallery's documentation for this scroll, while showing the successive paintings, seven of them, that make up the work and commenting on them. The next, please, the first section. The ode for this section reads, O oh, to go home. Field and garden will be weeds. How can I not go home? Since I made my mind my body's thrall, how very sad and sorry I have been. I know not to blame what is done and gone, and I'm aware I must follow what's to come. As I've not strayed too far from the path, I feel today is right and yesterday wrong. Far, far fares my boat with a gentle breeze. Wind whirls and swirls, flapping my robes. I ask other travelers about the road ahead, and grudge that morning's light is still so faint. Then I glimpse the eaves of home. I leap for joy and start to run. Serving boys welcome me with cheer. My young sons await me at the gate. The three trails are all overgrown, but pine and chrysanthemum remain. In this uh, long first section of the Fair Scroll, we first see Tao Yuanming arriving by boat. He's seen in his familiar image as if he were walking through the forest, not as if he were standing in a boat. And then on the shore, servants in 